Hello, class. I am uh, starting, uh, I, I, I think it's the seventh lecture. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure it's the seventh lecture. Anyway, what I want to do today is I'm still sort of working through the first chapter. And I have to admit that uh, in going through the chapter, I see a lot of things that, you know, I want to, to bring up. And uh, then that leads me on to a lot of other topics that I, uh, that are sort of contiguous with uh, topics in the first chapter. And so I wanted to touch on those too, because, you know, I've got so many notes from so many different courses that I've taught on this. And um, so I want to bring up those things too. And I also want to cement some concepts that uh, you, ha you have to remember and just take with you as we go along through this course. I keep saying this, you're going to get sick of me saying this. Uh, I've, taught, I've taught this course so many times that I, uh, I know from tests and assessment that even though I say this, even though, and, and you're going to hear it 400 times, uh, permeability when you see that, is not permeability. When, when you see just mu all by itself, that really refers to the permeability of the material, right? And the permeability of the material is always the relative permeability times the absolute permeability. Uh, I, I tell people this, and then so many times, you know, in the question, I put down what the relative permeability is, and the person just uses that in the equation rather than multiplying the relative permeability times the absolute permeability. I don't know why students fall down on this so much, because to me, even the first time I saw it, it, it just clicked. Uh, and, and that's what it, what it is. And I also want to say that uh, almost the beginning of every lecture, I suppose, uh, about the permittivity as well. Permittivity is the relative permittivity times the absolute permittivity. And I want to point out another thing too, because I think in the in one of the lectures that I, I did, I, I forgot to put the square root on uh, or, or the uh, sub r on um, the velocity of propagation. And velocity of propagation for an electromagnetic wave is the speed of light divided by, and you'll see this in, in uh, a lot of different uh, textbooks and stuff, divided by the relative permittivity. And that's what they say. And that's, uh, you know, when you, you're, you're figuring out what the velocity of propagation is for a waveform going through a coaxial cable, for instance, right? Let's just, uh, for instance, that would be, uh, well, the speed of light we know is 300 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, and then divided by the square root of 2.38. I already know what this is, but, you know, I'm going to do it on the calculator here just so I can give you a very uh, exact answer. Yeah, that is 194, I always think 195, but 194.46 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. So you can see that that uh, is, uh, in fact, I'll tell you exactly what it is. Uh, anyway, it's about two-thirds, right? So it's about two-thirds the speed of light. Um, is what the velocity of propagation is through a um, coaxial cable. And why do I say that through a coaxial cable? And you know, I, 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 we're going to be talking a lot about transmission through um, metallic conductors. And a coaxial cable, of course, especially for radio frequency transmission, is a, a standard out there in the industry now. And you should understand, uh, you know, what the standards are and everything else. And we'll get into that for a coaxial cable for a 75 ohm coaxial cable, which is standard for the cable industry right now. Of course, in scientific uh, instrumentation, we use 50 ohms and 56 ohms 
as standards, but 75 ohms is the cable standard. So that's what I usually talk about because, you know, you guys may go uh, to work in communications. And of course, communications would be a lot of 75 ohm cable. Now, let's get back to this. So, uh, what is the relative permittivity? What is that relative permittivity of? Is it of the copper that is the, the core conductor? Or is it uh, of the aluminum that makes up the, the braid that goes around there? Well, <laughs> the answer to that question, of course, is a trick question, isn't it? Because it's neither the conductor nor the, uh, it's the dielectric. It's the relative permittivity of the, the foamed polyethylene inside the thing, because that's where the waveform is traveling. It's traveling in the foam between the two conductors. I know, I know. We're gonna talk more about that in this lecture too, uh, both with permittivity as well as permeability. Uh, I forgot to put my timer on, so. Just a second, let me uh, try to uh, do that. Uh, there we go. Now, um, all right, let's get back to this. So, so that's my coaxial cable, and that's what the dielectric is. And if I wanted to find out what the relative permittivity of the dielectric is, it's 2.38 for the foam polyethylene that's uh, inside there. I want to point out another thing too. You know, you'll you'll see in a lot of literature that this uh, is the equation for the velocity of propagation, like through the po uh, foam polyethylene and stuff like that. In fact, it's not really. And in fact, I want to uh, uh, expand that a little bit from uh, you know what it is, because if you remember before, I said that the speed of light in vacuum, that's in outer space. So coming from the sun to the earth or whatever, right? So in the vacuum of space is one divided by the square root of the permeability times the permittivity, right? And now in outer space, so I'm just gonna put down uh, FS here to stand for free space or the vacuum. That would be mu sub zero epsilon sub zero, wouldn't it? So mu sub zero, epsilon sub zero gives me the speed of light. And if I was to punch those in there, I would get something around 299.94, I think it is, times 10 to the six meters per second, right? So we, we round it to 300 times 10 to the six meters per second. Of course, uh, scientists use three times 10 to the eight meters per second, but you know, as engineers, we try, even though that is a scientific constant. And that's what I'd like to say about scientific constants right now. When you're using a scientific constant, it doesn't really matter whether you use three times 10 to the eight or you use three times, uh, 300 times 10 to the six. You know, I'm looking at two uh, scientific constants here, Boltzmann's constant. Now Boltzmann's constant is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per degree Kelvin, right? Now it's not, uh, uh, what would that, 138 times 10 to the minus 21, is it? No, that's not how they write it because it's a scientific constant. And uh, Planck's constant here, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. You know, again, so those things don't follow the multiples of three like we do in engineering. Uh, just use those. I, I, I certainly don't care if in your professional careers you use uh, 300 times 10 to the six or three times 10 to the eight. I, I don't think that really makes much difference. I wanna get back to this though. Let's say that instead of the speed of light in uh, this, we're talking about the speed of light in glass. Well, then we would say that the speed of light in glass is going to be equal to one over the square root of the permeability of glass 
times the permittivity of glass. Does everyone see what I'm saying there? Well, you know, we've got a, 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 that's really then one over the square root of mu sub r times mu sub o of glass, right? Mu sub r of glass, I'll put a g down there even though you can't see that. And then uh, epsilon sub r times epsilon sub o. And that epsilon sub r would also be of glass, right? And so then really I could take that out of there. I could say that this is really one over the square root of mu sub o times epsilon sub o times one over the square root of mu sub r times epsilon sub r. You see what I'm doing? And then really that says that this should be c divided by the square root of mu sub r times epsilon sub r. Now, do you see the difference? Do you see the difference uh, where we say the velocity of propagation is c divided by the square root of epsilon uh, r? And we don't take into the uh, account uh, mu sub r? That's right, we don't take into account mu sub r, do we? And that's because in almost all electrical, you know, conductive uh, 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 communication systems that we use, mu sub r is one. So in uh, just about everything that we have, mu sub r is going to be equal to one. And that's why they, they take the mu sub r out of there. But for your information, since you're all going to be research scientists at the graduate level, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> or whoever in the group is going to be. And I, I have quite a large percentage of students of mine that actually go on to study at the graduate level. Um, but I just wanted to point that out to you. Not only that, when you start to see things like uh, the velocity of propagation through a fiber optic is going to be one over n, right? The index of refraction of the transparent material. Well, what then really is n? n is really the square root of mu sub r epsilon sub r. And uh, that's all taken into consideration when they come up with the index of refraction, which is really, uh, anyway, I'm, we are not going to get to that point probably. <laughs> uh, but there's so many things to go on, and, and, and I'm just, we're just starting. So we're just in chapter one right now. So I just thought that I'd point that out for you, because later on, you may think to yourself, well, hey, you know, I have, because uh, you may have derived this yourself, and you'll say, hey, what happened to the musabar? And the reason is musabar is still there. It's just that uh, because musabar for most, like, for instance, the relative permeability of copper, one. The relative permeability of aluminum one. The relative permeability of just about everything except steel. The relative permeability of steel is not one, is it? That's right. The relative permeability of steel is 1,000. Now, it's actually can be more than 1,000. I'm talking about electrical steel that has been prepared, but uh, you know, uh, just regular electrical steel, the per relative permeability is, is about 1,000. Now again, remember, uh, I'm gonna now talk about the Biot-Savart uh, law and give you an example here too. So we're gonna start talking about the Biot-Savart law. And, uh, you know, that, that also is mentioned in the first chapter of your textbook. But let's get back to what I was originally saying. Mu is always mu sub r times mu sub o. Epsilon is always epsilon sub r times epsilon sub o. Now, what is mu sub o? That's 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 henrys per meter. What is epsilon sub zero? That is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 
farads per meter. Memorize those now like you'd memorize pi or Euler's constant. Euler's constant. 2.71828. Just flows off your tongue, doesn't it? You'll use that more and more. The further that you go in engineering education, the more that you're, you're going to be running into Euler's constant. So just uh, you know, start to use it. Now, this is an interesting thing here, and I want to point this out with the Beals of Art Law. Uh, the Beals of Art Law basically says that if I have a a wire, right? And I'm running current through that wire. Let's say that I've got a wire here. I've got current running through that wire. There's my current. There's the direction of the current. Let's take my right hand now. Now my right hand thumb is pointing in the direction of the current. Which way is the magnetic field going? The magnetic field is wrapping itself around the wire like this, around the wire in that direction. Does everybody see how their hand just sort of follows that, right? The direction and then the wrapping. So that if I was looking, let's just look at, if I'm looking at the waveform from this direction, right? I'll just draw it right underneath there. So if I'm looking, then, then the current is coming toward me. Do you see the little dot? The little dot represents the current is coming toward me. Uh, if I wanted it going away from me, uh, it, anyway, uh, I can draw that later. It's an X. So, so toward is a, is a dot, that's an arrow. It's like an arrow is coming right at you to kill you. And then uh, the X is away and of course, what is the, the X's are the feathers on the back of the arrow going away from you. So if I'm looking at it from this direction, the current is coming in this direction, right? So let me put my thumb in that direction, then you can see how the magnetic field is going around the thing in an angular direction, isn't it? If I was looking at it using um, cylindrical coordinate systems, it would be in an angular direction. And so that's why we say that uh, when we're looking at the magnetic field or the flux density of the magnetic field uh, around there, it's going to be mu. Now I'm gonna just use mu here because I wanna point something out to you. Uh, mu times I divided by 2 pi r, okay? Now, let's say that I had a 10 amp uh, line. I'm putting 10 amps through that right now, right? I've got 10 amps there and, I, and it's a very thin wire. Let's say the wire is just uh, only is, is one millimeter radius, all right? So if it's a one millimeter radius, then that would make it a 0 0.001 meters, wouldn't it? And you know, uh, let's say that this is uh, in the beginning, it's flowing through, it's a wire in air. So surrounding this wire is air. Right? Okay. So I've got air all around the wire, and I know that the relative permittivity of air is 1.0006, I think it is. I'm going to say that it's uh, approximately equal to one, right? Because air and outer space, we, you know, we as humans, it's amazing we even live on this planet are living very close to the vacuum in so many ways. Uh, so uh, that would be my relative permittivity. Of course, let's not forget, oh, 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 excuse me. I'm sorry, why am I writing permittivity there? That would be my relative permeability uh, for air, okay? 
and I'm going to say that it's approximately one, like for most things. So, so let me write that down here. The, I'm going the relative permeability that I'm going to use here is going to be uh, one. Now we've got uh, one more thing that we have to write down there. We have to have the uh, absolute uh, permeability, and of course we know that's four pi times ten to the minus seven. Henry's per meter, right? Okay. So if I throw those all into that, oh, you know what I forgot? I forgot to put the uh, unit vector in the direction that it's going because it is a vector, remember, and it's not going in that direction. When I have a current flowing through here, it doesn't make a uh, a magnetic field in the same direction as the current, does it? No, it makes a magnetic field 90 degrees to the current, right? The current is coming this way. It's coming out of the page. Oh, uh, this, this, who? I'm not even sure. Uh, it's coming out of the page, and this is going around it at uh, a 90 degree angle to it, right? So that's good. So that's, I just wanted to put that in there. That's the, uh, the phi unit vector, just like uh, I is the unit vector for the X direction, J is the unit vector for the Y direction, and K is the unit vector for the Z direction. Uh, phi is the unit vector for the phi direction in cylindrical coordinates. And I'm just using cylindrical coordinates here because it's, uh, this is a cylindrical, you know, it lends itself to cylindrical coordinate systems rather than Cartesian coordinate systems. And, and, and that's something that, you know, for the rest of your life you're going to be doing. So you're going to be working in cylindrical, spherical uh, coordinate systems in addition to Cartesian coordinate systems. So let's get back to this. And we'll be talking about those soon enough anyway. So let's get back to this. So we can see, and I'm just looking really at the magnitude here, not so much the direction, although I wanted to show you the direction and the right-hand rule, and I also wanted to show you, you know, I really should have drawn that larger so you could see it, see X like that. Um, so let's put some numbers in here then. Okay, so B is going to be uh, one, right? That's mu sub R times four pi times 10 to the minus seven, Henry's per meter. Notice how many times I do this over and over and over and over and over and, and, and over and over again and keep writing this down over and over and over again so that you get it. It's not easy. <laughs> so on the first test, just show me that, you don't ha that I don't have to do this anymore. All right, times 10 amps, right? 10 amps, you're thinking 10 amps, that's quite a bit of current there times two pi, and you know, we've certainly made the wire thin enough, uh, times 0 0.001 meters. Okay, and I have already put that cake in the oven, and I believe that that is going to give us point zero zero to approximately, I think it's 0 0.00199999, but you get the idea. And what would those units uh, uh, be in? What is B? B is magnetic flux density. And I'm going to assume <laughs> that from your motors and controls, since that's like the second lecture, that you probably already know magnetic flux density's uh, units. So I'm just gonna put Tesla's right there. Uh, I, I may at some time go through, I did that dimensions and units one, but I may go through a little bit further just to, you know, derive Tesla's, derive Weber's, uh, and things like that, maybe. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, I think everybody, real. I hope to God, everybody realizes that magnetic flux density is in Tesla's and what the um, combination of primary units are for a Tesla and a Weber and a Henry. Although I may go through those anyway. Uh,
you know, I'll do it right now. Uh, a Weber is a kilogram meter squared over second squared amp. Now, doesn't a Weber look just like a uh, volt, except instead a volt has seconds cubed, whereas a Weber has seconds squared, kilogram meters squared over second squared amp. That's a Weber. Remember, as, a, as an engineer, you're, you're always doing dimensional analysis to see where you can cut corners and stuff like that. So that's a Weber. And what is a Weber a unit of? A Weber is a unit of flux, right? Um, a Henry. A Henry is a kilogram meter squared over second squared amp squared. Now, doesn't a Henry look a lot like an ohm, except it's second squared rather than seconds cubed? So that's right, a Henry looks a lot like an ohm. Now, what is a Tesla? A Tesla is a Weber per square meters, right? Well, there's a Weber and there's square meters in the numerator, so a Tesla then would just be a kilogram per second squared amp. Does everyone see that? So that's what a Tesla is. A Tesla and B, B of course is the same thing. That's just going to be um, flux divided by cross-sectional area, right? As you remember from your <laughs> motors and controls day, I hope to God. And um, so anyway, uh, that's, that's sort of what we've got here. Now, here's what I want to point out. And I, I'm doing this in this lecture because this lecture is really about what the heck is permeability <laughs> and what the heck is permittivity? What the heck are they? What are they? I'm not saying, I mean, here's all the mathematics. We've got the mathematics. We're using the mathematics here. Oh, I've shifted it. Uh, to, to do all this, we, we understand all of the mathematics. We understand that mu is used in magnetic, you know, materials, that mu is really the, the magnetic constant, and, and uh, epsilon is really the electrical constant here, that, that permittivity is all about electric fields, and permeability is all about magnetic fields. But the real question is, what are they? And I'm going to refer you to page 15 in your book. It also makes you get the book and look at page 15. Because on page 15, you see the polarization of the atoms in that material. Now, here's what permeability and permittivity are. They, let's go to permittivity first. It's how much electric field you can cram into a certain cross section, a certain distance in a material. How much can you cram in there? The higher the relative permittivity, the greater the electric field strength can be created inside that material. Same thing with permeability. The greater relative permeability, the greater magnetic field can be contained 
in that material. So for instance, with steel, if you just have a piece of steel, that piece of steel isn't naturally magnetic, is it? No, it's just a piece of uh, steel, just laying there, it's just, just steel. But if I bring a magnet, whether it's an electromagnet or a natural magnet or anything, up to that piece of steel that you have. The steel creates a magnetic field inside itself, doesn't it? An equal and opposite magnetic field is created and the magnetic field lines as they enter the steel realign the magnetic domains in the steel and allow a magnetic field to exist in that steel and a large magnetic field. So here's what I want to do. Here's, here's what I want to do to uh, uh, point that out to you. Right? Here's what I want to do. Let's do the Biot Savart law again. Let's calculate that again. We're going to use the same thing that we use, and, and, and you probably know, I'm just gonna draw it down here. I don't know, uh, I wanna see on there where I can go here, yeah. So just to uh, refresh your memory, what does the BH diagram look like for steel? What is the saturation curve for the magnetization of steel, right? It looks like this. Right? And this right here is what we designed to. That right there, because as you remember, B equals mu H. Well, isn't B the Y axis, right? Y equals MX. Isn't, isn't B the Y axis and H the X axis? So B equals mu H, isn't mu the slope of the line? That's right, the slope of this line is mu. That's the slope of that line right there. Uh, you know, another thing that I wanna just point out, uh, I'm sure that you were taught this, you know, when you were doing your, your motors and controls, but where does that plateau off for steel? You know, if instead of it plateauing off at two Tesla, it plateaued off at 20 Tesla, we'd all be flying magnetic repulsion cars all over the place right now. <laughs> of course, we'd probably be dead for some other reason. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so I love, I love to point that out to students because I love to teach magnetics. One of the things that I don't think students get enough of is, is magnetics. And that's why I love to teach motors and controls and, and I love to teach electromagnetics. I can't teach everything. Uh, but um, yeah, that, that's very interesting. So uh, I just wanted to point that out. You know, I also want to point out, you know, how does the uh, per per permeability change? If I made another axis over here and I said that this was my uh, uh, permeability, how does the permeability change? Well, you know, over here, it's zero, isn't it? And then when it gets up to this, it goes to a maximum and it stays at that maximum until it gets there and then it starts rolling over again, doesn't it? So it comes back down. So if I wanted to graph uh, a thing of the permeability and, and where do, again, where I say, where do we design? We design for here. We design in this region right here where we have a constant, mu, where we can say, okay, well, electrical steel, uh, you know, over the range of the applied, of, of the applied uh, uh, magnetic field is going to have a response like this, right? And we're going to, we're going to have a nice straight line there. And uh, we can, we can design in that area all the way up to two Tesla. And, uh, 
Anyway, I don't want to get too, too far involved and off the, the course of electromagnetic waves. It is electromagnetic, uh, even though I'm partial to magnetics. But anyway, here's what I wanted to show you. What if instead of this running through air, what if it was running through steel? In fact, let, let me just uh, give you a, a, for instance, let's say that I made like a piece of steel, right, like that. And I had the wire, uh, you know, who, who knows how I put it? Maybe it's four different bricks of steel that all, uh, you know, line up, right? And, and then, uh, you know, I just, just put these. So they're all steel bricks. And I've just run a wire right in between those bricks so that, so that the wire now is surrounded by steel. What changes? Well, all of a sudden, that becomes 1,000, doesn't it? That's right. 1,000 instead of 1. Everything else is the same, isn't it? 2 pi times 0 0.001 meters. Everything else is the same. So 1,000, doesn't that change that to 2 tesla? I wanted you to see that because we're still in chapter one and we're still talking about, you know, magnetostatics and electrostatics and stuff. And I, I, I wanted you to see that and see how now we can set up uh, two Tesla. And that's just 10 amps. That's a 10 amp wire. So as long as the 10 amp wire is running through your wall, you got no problem. <laughs> but once you put that 10 amp wire and you start to surround it with steel, electrical steel, so you can start to see all the applications there. And I just wanted to get back to, you know, generators, the stuff that you did in generators and uh, motors and everything like that. I love, I love motors and controls. Anyway, uh, let's go back to, uh, to this because I wanted to talk about uh, a couple other things. Let me just check my time. I don't have much time. I, another thing that I wanted to, to point out is um, what is an electron volt? I'll talk more about this in the next lecture anyway, but I, I just wanted to point it out and start it here. What is an electron volt? Well, if you think about a volt, right, an electron, well, I shouldn't really say that because uh, an electron volt is, I'll give it to you, it's 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. You're probably thinking, well, joules, that's not joules, that's, a, that's the charge on an electron. Uh, the charge on an electron uh, and all of a sudden, instead of coulombs, you're using joules. But I'm not. How did I get those joules? Because an electron, the definition of electron volt is one volt, right? One volt times the charge on an electron, which would be 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And you're saying right now, well, are you telling me that a volt and a coulomb uh, make up a joule? That's right. Stay tuned for our next lecture. <laughs> I'll be back in a little while.